everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, finally defending the PhD dissertation. It's, it's been quite an adventure. And yeah, it's uh, also, I'm very happy to see so many, so many people here, about to hear uh, the work that I've been doing in the past four years. Just as a disclaimer, I only have 30 minutes to, to talk about these four years of work, so obviously I'm not going to have time to go into the details. Everything is on the dissertation. So uh, if you uh, have any questions when you read it, I'll be more than happy to assist you all. Okay, so I'm going to talk, beginning just to give a little bit of, of background, and uh, mostly I'm just going to talk about the structure of music, uh, which is mostly the reason why I'm here right now. Uh, as you may know, I'm, I'm a musician in my spare time, and I've been collaborating with several musicians, uh, and they mostly just send me an audio file, send me a, a waveform, and I get something like that, and they ask me, uh, okay, can you see on top of this? And the first thing I do is they analyze the track, and I see the different parts of the track, so I segmented it myself, uh, and that really helps me when understanding where to put the lyrics, uh, what are the parts that are similar so that I, I can also write the lyrics accordingly. That was really helpful. Uh, and I do this every time that I receive one of these audio files. And uh, as I was studying computer engineering, I thought maybe there could be a way that, that you know, computers could do this for us. Maybe it would be really helpful for, for me as a musician. And as I was studying uh, music technology and I, I discovered all of these fields of music information retrieval, I realized that there's already one task that does precisely this, or aims to do precisely this. But unfortunately, the, the results for these MIR tasks are, are far from being perfect. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here, to improve it uh, just a little bit. Uh, so why the improvements of this task actually matters? Well, the automatic discovery of the structure of music, as I said, uh, could assist musicians when composing in pieces, uh, help audio engineers when editing tracks as well. Imagine that uh, they work with Pro Tools or or logic, and they automatically can segment all the tracks. That would be actually very useful. But also for listeners, uh, I think improve, uh, this could improve actually the, the recommendation systems to recommend a music at a section level, if every, all the collection is analyzed at a section level. Uh, we could also make music players smarter by listening to all the pieces, skipping to, to the different parts of a song. Uh, we could generate music summers to preview tracks, we could yield better automatic DJ remix applications, or even produce interactive visualizations of music pieces for musicological reasons. Uh, so uh, these are some of the uh, features why this actually matters. So this will lead us to goal number one of this dissertation, which is to present novel automatic approaches to discover structure in music. But there is more in this dissertation. There's a, a second goal. And to uh, motivate the second goal, I will let you listen to this uh, little excerpt. I'm sorry you cannot really see it very well, but hopefully you'll, you'll listen to it clearly. Uh, uh, this segment, or this excerpt, sorry, I, I annotated it myself. Uh, so you will hear the verse, and you will hear actually a, 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 a cowbell every time there is a section change, every time there is a boundary. And, I, and again, I annotated this myself. to listen to this excerpt uh, because uh, if I were to ask you to segment this excerpt the same way that I did this large scale uh, segmentation, so all these uh, sections, it is very unlikely that I would get the exact same uh, segmentation that I did. Maybe you would place a boundary a little bit before, a little bit later, maybe you would consider these labels uh, different. Uh, so this, uh, I'm telling you this because uh, the perception of music uh, structure is highly subjective, okay? So that is one of the reasons why uh, I actually am going reaching to goal number two. And now we'll see how this plays a role in the music information retrieval field. So how 
do we as researchers in uh, music information retrieval uh, develop algorithms? Well, the standard methodology is, uh, first of all, we design our algorithm to, I don't know, extract chords, beats, uh, structure, and the algorithm has estimated results. And then we want to assess these estimated results, and we have a data set. And uh, in the data set, uh, we have reference annotations. Usually humans have annotated uh, these uh, tracks. Uh, and then we use these reference annotations to compare them uh, with the estimated results in an evaluation process. And this evaluation produces a metric or a set of metrics that then can be used to compare our algorithms in order to assess how good they are. We can also use these metrics to uh, adjust our algorithm in order to maximize these metrics in order to maximize uh, the performance. So everything is fine. This is the standard methodology. I'm not trying to change that. But there is only one annotation for track in most data sets. Okay? If, uh, as I told you, for music structure, your answer might be different than mine, your answer is still as valid as mine. So there is a problem with subjective tasks such as uh, music structure. Because if there's only one annotation for track, the evaluation is going to be biased by subjectivity. Okay, so this is the goal number one. The goal number two is to address the methodological issue of subjectivity inherent in the music segmentation task of MIR by proposing perceptual evaluations. And these are the two main goals of my dissertation. And I'm going to start with the first one, which are the automatic approaches. In this work, I propose four novel algorithms to discover the structure in music, one that will produce music summaries, another one that uh, will discover uh, musical patterns, another one uh, that segments music using a uh, machine tool, a machine learning tool, and another one that segments music using a more uh, DSP kind of tool. I'll talk about it in, in just a few minutes. So I'll start with the music summaries. Uh, the music summarization is a goal in MIR. Uh, that is, it's, it's one task in MIR that, whose goal is to obtain a brief uh, audio signal that summarizes uh, a music piece in, in just a few seconds. So you would get a, a nice preview of the track uh, in an automatic way. So as an example, I will just play you a music summary uh, of a really, really popular song. Is this the real life of So I tried to uh, capture the most representative parts of this piece in just a 30 seconds preview. And what we want to do is to do this in an automatic way. So the main idea that I propose is to identify the most repeated parts, which hopefully are the most relevant, uh, with the least amount of overlap. And to do that, I define a music summary criterion that uh, combines two values by taking the harmonic mean. Uh, one is the degree of compression, how well all the subsequences that I put together to create this music summary compress the whole track. Okay, so if they compress it a lot, it means that it's really repetitive. So, these subsequences. And at the same time, uh, I want the amount of disjoint information between the subsequences as high as possible. So I leverage these two uh, values with the harmonic mean, and, and that's it. Uh, so uh, the results of this algorithm, uh, there, unfortunately, there's no standard way of evaluating music summarization yet. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to play you an output uh, of my algorithm when, when inputting the Chopin's Mazurka Opus 30 number 2, which is a repeated, uh, which is a piece that has three repeated parts, A, A, B, B, and C, C. And the summary is composed of short parts of A, B, and C, as you will see. This is a part of A. This is a part of B. The algorithm is capable of identifying all the different parts and generating these automatically. Okay, the second algorithm is a pattern discovery algorithm. And the pattern discovery task in MIR, <coughs> the goal is to identify the repeated parts of a given music piece 
so I don't care whether they are uh, overlap and, and they do not need to cover the entire piece, just to find the uh, parts that are repeated in an audio signal. Uh, and to do that, we first establish the patterns. Uh, so I find all the repeated information and then once the patterns have been found, I cluster them based on uh, how similar they are. Uh, the shortest uh, parts are typically motifs, musical motifs, and the longest parts are typically large-scale sections of, such as verse, bridge, chorus. As the, the canonical example of a music motif is the beginning of the fifth symphony of Beethoven. The dun, 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 dun. Uh, so the proposed approach, uh, the main idea is to make use of music segmentation techniques to obtain the most repeated parts of a given audio track using a gritty algorithm. Uh, the music segmentation techniques usually exploit this repetitive factor so that I just use this in audio. Usually the pattern discovery task uh, is applied to symbolic representation. So I'm, I'm just using audio, applying these music segmentation techniques, and I define uh, a, a naive, uh, very simple, greedy algorithm that actually identifies these patterns from audio, and it yields uh, pretty successful results. Uh, okay, well, the results, I evaluated this on the JKU development data set, which is, uh, as far as I know, the, the, the only uh, data set for this specific MIR task. And I use the same metrics as in the, uh, the MIR evaluation exchange, which is the yearly competition where you can send your MIR algorithms and you can compare them against other uh, researcher algorithms. And I obtain state-of-the-art results when identifying the occurrences in audio, the occurrences, so once I establish the pattern, when I cluster them and I try to identify the rest of the patterns that are similar, when compared to audio-based algorithms that do not apply music transcription techniques. So what do all other researchers do? Well, the first thing that they do in order to approach this task, first, they apply an algorithm to extract all the notes, and then they apply an algorithm that is symbolic-based. It's kind of first obtaining the score, and then they, they uh, apply a, a symbolic approach. If I just work with the audio without the score at all, without applying a, a, a transcription algorithm, uh, I obtain state-of-the-art results. However, the symbolic approaches yield superior results in that aspect, in identifying the rest of the patterns when you, once you establish that. However, I obtain state-of-the-art results when establishing patterns in audio. I obtain, uh, it is the best algorithm right now, as far as I know, to identify the patterns uh, in an audio signal. Uh, and that is comparable uh, and sometimes better than other symbolic approaches. Uh, that is, uh, that I think this is uh, remarkable because these symbolic approaches uh, tend to be overcomplicated and they tend to uh, take a long time to process most of, of the results. And I don't even need the, the score for, the, for identifying this. So uh, yeah, I think that's why I'm quite happy about this. Uh, okay. Uh, Let's talk about the third algorithm, the music segmentation with convex NMF. So what is music segmentation? Music segmentation is a task in MIR whose goal is to identify the different segments or section, sections of a music piece. It's essentially what you saw in the beginning with this uh, little movie that I played with Porcupine Tree. Uh, and there are two subparts in this problem. First, to determine the section boundaries, these cowbells that you listened to in the beginning. And then to label the different segments based on their audio similarity, okay? Uh, the segments tend to represent large-scale musical sections such as verse, chorus, or bridge. So this approach that I, that I, that I propose, uh, the idea is to factorize a harmonic representation into different segment prototypes. Such as these are called centroids in the machine learning uh, uh, language. And uh, I used to do that, the convex non-negative matrix factorization. And I rely into, into this idea that, that music segments can have homogeneous harmonic distributions. So it's that the, the chorus will have a harmonic progression that will be uh, homogeneous throughout the chorus and the which will be very differentiated in that aspect. And uh, why I use convex non-negative matrix factorization? Because it yields uh, much more superior results or much more meaningful centroids or segment prototypes than regular uh, non-negative matrix factorization. Okay, the results for this algorithm uh, were evaluated with the uh, isophonic uh, Beatles and the Salami datasets, which are standard uh, datasets for uh, music segmentation. I use the same metrics as in Mirix again, and I obtained state-of-the-art uh, results when compared to other approaches that only extract homogeneous segments, and in terms of boundary retrieval and also label grouping. 
Of course, these are not state-of-the-art for music segmentation because there are other algorithms that focus on other types of segments that yield superior results. Finally, the last uh, algorithm that I propose here is music segmentation with uh, 2D FMC. What is this? Well, uh, the proposed approach, I am actually just focusing on capturing the similarity between the segments. I'm not actually trying to find the, the boundaries. I'm not trying to find the, these cowbells that you listened to in the beginning uh, between segments. Uh, I'm just looking to find uh, the similarity between the segments. Okay, and ideally, we would like to have a representation that is key invariant, such that uh, if one verse uh, is key transposed, is a key transposed version of another verse, I would consider them the same, as long as the chord progression is the same. Uh, if ideally it also would be shift invariant, that means that if a motif occurs in the middle of a section, it doesn't matter if then in another segment that is similar it occurs in the beginning, as long as it occurs in both places. And that is tempo agnostic, and I obtain that by uh, having beat synchronous uh, features. And the ideal candidate, or one of the ideal candidates, would be the 2D Fourier magnitude coefficients, because that would actually allow us to have key invariant uh, features, shift invariant features, and the tempo agnostic, as I said, that we would be obtaining it by, by using a beat synchronous feature. Uh, with, uh, with these patches for all of these uh, uh, different segments, I take one of these 2D Fourier magnitude coefficients, and then I simply uh, cluster them using k-means, and that, that's how I get the, the similarity. The results for this algorithm are evaluated again on the isophonic beetles and the salami data set using uh, the mirrored metrics, and I take competitive results using round truth boundaries. Well, that means that, that when I use boundaries, that, that have been manually annotated, which should be perfect, I obtain really, really high results. They might be state-of-the-art results, I don't know, because I, I don't have access to the rest of the algorithms, uh, to the open, to the source code, so such that I can input the ground truth. Uh, but uh, they're, they're the highest that I have from the algorithms that I have to go to. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they have a strong, the, the results have a strong impact when I use estimated boundaries. When the boundaries are not perfect, the 2D FMCs uh, are, are not as good because we need to have the exact uh, periodicity for the 2D Fourier magnitude coefficients to, to work better. In any case, this is highly, highly efficient in terms of computation times. This is really, really fast. Actually, this was initially proposed to, to solve large-scale cover song ID. And, uh, and it takes like 13 seconds to, to compute the entire Beatles catalog once the, the features are pre-computed in this machine. Okay. Summary of goal one, I have presented four novel approaches to discover certain aspects of music structure. Uh, first one, algorithm for music summaries, another one for pattern discovery, uh, the source code is here, uh, and two algorithms for music segmentation, one that uses convex and non-negative matrix factorization, and another one that uses two-dimensional Fourier magnitude coefficients. And these two algorithms uh, are included in this package called MSAF, Music Structure Analysis Framework, that is a framework that I work for for this dissertation and it's open source and it includes many other uh, music segmentation algorithms if you are uh, interested. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about goal number two to address the methodological issue of subjectivity inherent in the music segmentation task of MIR by proposing perceptual evaluations. So what are these perceptual evaluations that I'm gonna to present today? There are two of them and the first one uh, it will produce metrics for multiple annotations per track. And the second one uh, will actually modify existing metrics uh, to align better with perception. Okay, uh, both uh, in, this, in this section, I'm gonna use tools from uh, music perception and cognition in order to uh, achieve uh, or to realize and design this perceptual evaluation. So let's start with the first one. I'm gonna try to uh, come up with metrics for multiple annotations per track. So going back to this slide with the MIR methodology, where I expose this problem, what I aim to do now is to add uh, multiple annotations per track instead of just one. Uh, this is pretty common in, in music perception and cognition to work with uh, many subjects instead of just having one person uh, with some annotations. <coughs> okay, so I'm including 
uh, some of these tools here, uh, some of the ideas for music perception and cognition, and that will hopefully, by having multiple annotations, by having all of your last annotations and my annotation, hopefully this evaluation will be less biased by subjectivity. So, in order to do that, I will first need to collect a bunch of multiple annotations. So I first need the tracks uh, to get these multiple uh, annotations. So to select these tracks, I will use an automatic approach. And from a large collection of over 2,000 tracks that I, uh, I, that I collected, uh, humanly annotated, one each, one annotation per each, I run multiple boundary retrieval algorithms, and I rank them based on the standard metric of music segmentation, which is the F measure, at uh, three seconds. And then I choose the 45 worst performing ones, which should be the worst performing algorithms from a machine point of view, the most challenging ones. And then I also choose the five best performing tracks, uh, which should be trivial from a machine point of view to segment. Then I asked uh, five music experts to segment uh, these 50 automatically selected tracks at two uh, levels of segmentation, large scale and small scale. Large scale would be, uh, as I said, the sections, uh, verse, bridge, chorus. Small scale would be uh, phrases or parts of these large scale sections. So now each track will contain five additional two layer segmentation annotations. And what I'm gonna do is an analysis of subjectivity by checking the differences between all the annotations. Okay, so to do that, I analyze the variation of the scores when evaluating the estimated boundaries with the new annotations. Uh, and to do that, I use a two way ANOVA which is uh, pretty common in music perception and cognition, uh, with, uh, aver uh, with of the average of the F measure with algorithms and, and annotations as factors. And I'll start with the control group. So here, I know that you cannot really see it very clear, but what we have here is the uh, F scores, okay? And here we have the different annotators. And these lines represent the algorithms, okay? So if I have annotator number one, I will get pretty consistently that all the is the best performing algorithm. For annotator two, the same thing, and the worst is a CC, constraint cluster. So we can see here that this is, this is pretty consistent. This is actually what we want. We do not want a lot of variation depending on what annotator we're using to, run up to evaluate uh, our algorithms. And this is actually confirmed by the ANOVA because there's no significant uh, variation uh, for the control group when using different annotations. Okay, but what would happen with the challenging uh, tracks? So here we have the, the marginal means of the ANOVA, and here we can see that this is kind of all over the place. Uh, annotator one, the best algorithm, well, it tells us that it's the checkerboard kernel. For annotator two, it tells us that it's the structural features kernel uh, algorithm. Uh, the, for annotator five, it tells us that it's all the, so, so we cannot really rely on, on, on just one annotation because people actually perceive uh, music structure in such a different way. Uh, so actually the ANOVA confirms that there's significant variation for the control group. So significant variation when using different annotations for the challenging tracks. Therefore, uh, the subjectivity is a relevant problem when evaluating music boundaries, uh, at least on the challenging tracks. So can we minimize the subjectivity effect for this task? And yes, by merging, uh, annotated boundaries, and I'm going to present four types of merging. The first type of merging is to go from flat annotations into a weighted uh, flat annotation. So this would be, this would represent the track, and this would be the little boundaries, that, the boundaries that, that they find. And I just take an average, and I and now instead of having one or zero, I have an actual real value vector here. It would be uh, merging type one. Merging type two would go from hierarchical to weighted flat. Why hierarchical? Well, remember that I asked all the annotators to segment at two levels, the large scale and the small scale. So that could be interpreted as a hierarchical annotation. So I take all of them, and again, I take the average, and I obtain a weighted flat uh, annotation. Uh, merging type three is, essentially, is going from flat to hierarchical. It's essentially the same as type one. We have here the weighted flat, but then I interpret this as, a, as another hierarchical annotation. And finally, merging type four is hierarchical to hierarchical. This is essentially uh, type two, but then I again interpret this as a hierarchical annotation. Okay, so now I'm gonna test the robustness of these merged boundaries. 
And to do so, instead of uh, doing an ANOVA with uh, annotations here, what I'm going to do is to have collection of annotations. So I'm going to take actually three annotations each. Uh, so I'm going to have sets of three annotators. Uh, and I'm going to do some, some, something, something similar as, as cross-validation in machine learning. So I'm going to end up having uh, 10 uh, sets of three annotators each. And that's, I'm going to see how much of variation we have by uh, applying uh, the ANOVAs on types 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Yeah. For each type, we'll compute the two-way ANOVA with algorithm sets as factors. So these are the results of the ANOVAs for each, well, these are the marginal means for each of the different types. And you can see that they are much more uh, flat, which is what we wanted. And actually, the DNOVA results confirm that, except for type number three. What happens in type number three? Well, if we use set one, uh, here, all the results are kind of lower, the F measures. But for set one, uh, well, the set 10 are much higher. So there's a little bit of variation. but Yes, that's okay because this we can always see that the SF algorithm is always higher. You can see that this one is the second. There is no actual conflicts not for type three or type four. So this is again desirable. So except type three, none of the scores significantly vary depending on the set chosen, and there are no conflicts in marginal means in types three and types four. So there are not actually conflicts. There will be conflicts here, but not here. Okay. So this is the first perceptual evaluation that I propose. And the second one, what I, what I propose is to modify existing metrics to align better with perception. In case we do not have uh, access to additional annotations, what can we do? So first of all, I need to talk about how we evaluate music segmentation. And the standard metric is the F measure, or the F1 score, which quantizes the similarity between annotations, uh, references on the estimated results, and what I ask is, is it appropriate in the framework of music segmentation? Does it align with humans' perception of the structure of music? Uh, so I aim to perceptually redefine the F measure uh, for this music uh, segmentation task for the music of families. So the F measure, how does it work? Well, it finds the intersection be be between reference annotations and estimated results. And the estimated boundaries are correct if they are within three seconds from a reference point. The three seconds window is the standard in the, in the field, even though now maybe switching to, to 0 0.5 a little bit. And now it tries to leverage two values, like the music summarization criterion. It takes the harmonic mean of two values. The first one, the precision, which is the ratio between hits and the total number of estimated elements. <coughs> and the second one is the recall, which is the ratio between hits and the total number uh, of elements in the reference. And then, as I said, you take the harmonic mean of these two, and, uh, and then the harmonic mean, what it does is to weight both values equally. Uh, it penalizes outliers, and it also mitigates the impact of large values. So in terms of uh, boundary evaluation, uh, we obtain higher precision uh, that represents, <coughs> higher precision represents less false positives, and higher recall represents less false negatives. And when listening to estimated results for music segmentation, it becomes apparent that these two values are perceptually very different. Okay, so uh, in order to assess the, how we actually perceive this, uh, I designed two experiments. And these experiments uh, were designed to explore the preferences between precision and recall, <coughs> and they were conducted online with 48 and 23 participants respectively. Were they were designed uh, differently, but both they were aiming at, at obtaining this uh, to uh, understand the, the difference between precision and recall in perception. And these results suggest that precision tends to be more perceptually salient than recall. So humans prefer to listen to less but correct than more but necessarily not necessarily precise boundaries. Okay? So what can we do with these results? We can adapt them uh, in order to uh, redefine this uh, the F measure. We can use them to redefine this uh, F measure. And this formula here is the generic uh, formula for the F measure. And this alpha parameter, it actually is the, is the parameter that weights P, the precision, or the recall. When alpha equals one, we have the, the recall and the precision have the exact same weight. That's why the F measure sometimes is called the F1 score, because it weights them equally. 
On the other hand, if alpha is uh, greater than one, uh, we give more importance to the recall value, and if alpha is less than one, we give more importance to the precision value. Because of the results that I obtained, it is clear that we shouldn't have an that we should have an alpha that is less than one, so that we can give more uh, importance to the precision value. Okay. Uh, in the dissertation, I propose a method in order to come up with a more specific value of the alpha. But I also discussed that we might need more data, human data, in order to have a more generic value. And mo mostly, probably, we will need. Uh, many different values depending on the music genre or some other musical aspects. Okay, so that's it. Uh, summary of goal two. I have proposed two perceptual evaluations. One, to merge multiple annotations because data sets with a single human annotation per track are prone to error. And merging multiple annotations can significantly alleviate the subjectivity effect. And the second one, what I did is to redefine the F measure because I conducted some experiments that uh, the results tell us that the precision value of the F measure seems to be perceptually more relevant than the recall value. Uh, including these perceptual evaluations that come from more uh, from a music perception and recognition point of view into the MIR methodology would result in applications that, that better align with, with human preference. And that's it. I'm going to talk about conclusions and future work. I presented four novel methods to automatically discover structure in music. I presented two novel evaluations for uh, music segmentation that better align with human perception. I narrowed the gap between music information retrieval and music perception, uh, mostly helping music information retrieval with some of the music perception and cognition tools. Uh, and yeah, as, a, as in the future where I think structure is regarded as hierarchical, and I think it's, it's likely that in the future approaches to discover structure uh, might actually output hierarchical results and actually Dr. McPhee has already started uh, doing something like this. Uh, given the ambiguity of this task, in the future algorithms also may produce more than one valid answer. If we can have more than one valid answer because your answers are different than mine but both are, are valid, why not the algorithms might produce more than, than one valid answer. Uh, and finally, well, similar aggregation of uh, annotations could also be employed in other subjective MIR tasks. So this could be extrapolated uh, outside the, the music structure or music segmentation world of task of MIR, but to other tasks, maybe such as chords or tags or mood. And that's it. Just uh, I, I just wanted to thank uh, my committee, uh, Mary, Juan, and, and Tristan. Thank you so much for all the help throughout these years. And of course, thank you, uh, Alex and Mike, for, for being here as external readers. Also, thank you for my, my fellow PhD students that have helped me so much throughout all of these years. Uh, my, my, all the friends who come here today, my family, uh, my students, and yeah, it's been such an adventure. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Well, here are the references. I will upload this online, and that's it. Thank you so much.